Morning, everyone. So today we're working on absolute values. Now, absolute values, you guys might have remembered a definition from Algebra 1 and Geometry. And the main idea is distance away from zero. It seems a little bit abstract, but this is usually used for a distance measurement. How far are you away from the origin? Um, but let's look at this a different way. If I ask you, uh, what's the absolute value of three? This means, well, aren't you three spaces away from zero? On a number line, the number three is one, two, three spaces away from zero. But also, so is the number negative three. That would also give you three. Because that negative three here, we are also one, two, three spaces away. And distance for us is counted as a positive number. Distance for us, oops, I spelled that one. Distance is positive. When I ask you, how far is your friend's house from here? Three blocks. So you walk three blocks. When you walk home, do you walk a negative three blocks home? No. You say you walk three blocks home. Because distance, no matter which direction you're going in, is always going to be a positive number. Now, why is this important? Is because when we start getting into a 2D plane, numbers, what is the distance of 4, 5? Oh, sorry, whoops. Let's do 4, 3. What's the distance of 4, 3 from 0, 0? How far is this point away? And that question changes our definition of what a absolute value is going to do for us. Okay. So that's why it's more of a definition of a distance. And it looks kind of simple and plain on a 2D, sorry, 1D number line. But in 2D, it actually turns out to be the hypotenuse of a triangle that's 4 or 3. Okay. So if I ask you what's the distance from 4 or 3 to 0, the answer would be five units. So that's off the topic, but, but that's what absolute values really does for us. Now, taking us to this follow-up question, what if I write x, absolute value of x is equal to three? What possibilities would make this a true statement? Possibilities would be not only a regular plus three, right? We discussed, right? That would be three. So x is three. But on the other side, if I wrote a negative three, that would also give me a positive three as an answer. So x here would have to be negative three. So we end up with these two different divergent worlds, two different possibilities, two different problems. And here is the fast way of whenever I see an absolute value problem, this is what you do. You see, whenever you have an absolute value and you're trying to solve for it, solve for x, you actually just draw two arrows and you say x is equal to a negative three and x is equal to a positive three. Because wouldn't you agree that if I plugged in x is negative 3, my answer would be 3. And if I plugged in x is regular 3, my answer would also be 3. Uh oh, if you can hear that in the background, it's my kid acting up. In a good way, he's messing around. Okay, so let's make this problem a little harder. For right, absolute value of x plus 2 is equal to 5. Now this problem becomes a little more abstract, it becomes a little harder, more numbers involved. But just like what we did over here, we just have to split it into two versions, where x plus 2 is equal to a negative 5, and x plus 2 is equal to a regular 5. Please take of note that the inside parentheses 
does, sorry, inside absolute value does not change. What changes is the outside. One stays positive, one stays negative. One stays positive, one stays negative, or becomes negative. Okay. So please take that of note. Let's see if this actually works. We solve them separately. Now solve separately. So we minus two, minus two, minus two, minus two, because we're solving for x. x is equal to negative seven. x is equal to positive three. When we double check, if I plug in negative seven plus two, that's negative five. And absolute value of negative five gives me the five we want. Double check the three. Three plus two is five. Five. Absolute value of 5 is the 5 we want. So this is just a review of what we used to do with absolute values. Now, the problem gets, could, could become more difficult. Um, but we have different uh, ways of dealing with different scenarios. So what if the problem became larger? Mr. What if I wrote two x plus three? Lost you, Alex? Mr. Co, I have a question. Yeah, give me one sec. Okay, so for this example here, equals to let's say eleven. Okay. So whenever you have an absolute value problem, okay, we're just going to trade in our absolute values. Uh, it's almost like a castle. This is my castle with walls. Okay. In order for me to get at the people inside, I need to take down those walls. I want to take down the walls by trading them for two versions. 2x plus 3 is equal to negative 11, and 2x plus 3 is equal to a positive 11. Because okay? we want 2x plus 3 to equal to 11, so we minus 3 to both sides because we're solving these problems like we typically would. 2x is equal to negative 14, and 2x is equal to 8. Negative 11 minus 3 is negative 14. Um, 2x plus 3 is a new example. And then we divide both sides by 2. x equals to negative 7, x is equal to 4. We can double check. If I plug in negative 7 times 2, that's going to be 14. Negative 14 plus 3 is negative 11. Absolute value of negative 11 is 11. Okay, we, that one worked. 4 times 2 is 8 plus 3. That's 11. Hey, absolute value of 11 is 11. So we found the two possibilities. Now, in the IXL, it's going to ask you to graph these two answers. So on a number line, x could be what answer? x could be 4, put a solid dot, because the answer is 4, and the other answer is negative 7. So again, this is just a review of absolute values. Um, we're going to go one step harder. What if I have a bunch of stuff outside the absolute value? Now, absolute value problems are problems that you're going to see the rest of your time in, in high school. And these are on the SATs. So just be careful and make sure you do practice them out. So let's do something a little harder now. Abs um, we'll say two absolute value of x plus 5. Um, minus 4 is equal to, let's say, 12. Okay, a new problem. So our rule, remember, is this. I can trade an absolute value for a two plus version and a minus version. I can trade it for the two versions. But if you look here, I have a lot of trash on the outside of here. 
So here is what you don't want to do. You don't want to right now trade out and say, oh, it's 2x plus 5. This is wrong, okay? Don't trade into your two versions right now. Because if you do this, this is actually going to be horrifically wrong. But I flipped the other side. Now, remember order of operations? There's a specific way of doing things. And for us, our operations here is we want to get rid of everything else before we deal with this group. So we're going to get rid of the four, then get rid of the two, and then we'll finally deal with the absolute value. That's the order that we're going to work on this. And you'll see that, hey, once I simplify all this stuff on the outside, the problem looks kind of like what we did before. So first step, let's get rid of a four. If I plus four to both sides, I am not breaking any rules. Two absolute value of x plus five equals to 16. Okay. Hey, I can get rid of the two. Opposite multiply is divide. And now we end up with a problem that looks just like what we had before. Now we can use our rule where we can trade out our absolute value for a positive and a negative version. x plus 5 equals to 8, and x plus 5 equals to negative 8. Okay? So please don't try to trade out the absolute value too early. We want to get rid of all our constants, and then we can trade out afterwards. So minus 5, minus 5 minus 5 minus 5. x is equal to 8 minus 5 is 3. Negative 8 minus 5 is negative 13. On the number line, our answers are, oops, negative 13 and 3. We only have two answers that will make this a skip uh, make this a true statement. I'm going to go ahead and try the negative sign to see if it worked. 2 absolute value of negative 13 plus 5 minus 4 is equal to 12. Let's see if that worked. Negative 13 and 5 become negative 8. Um, absolute value of negative 8 is a positive 8. And we multiply 8 times 2 is 16 minus 4. Yep, that is 12. Who would have guessed that answer? I wouldn't. So that's how we have these processes. It might seem like it's extra work, but it's one of the easiest ways for us to just use our opposite operations to simplify and then break this absolute value into two versions. Now, we're going to graph absolute values now in a two-variable way. So please pay attention. This is only one variable, right? Only one variable. We've only been working with one variable. This is very Algebra 1-esque. So we're going to deal with this like if this was a line equation. And our two-variable version will be this. y is equal to absolute value of x. So we're dealing with two variables. Now when two variables happen, the problem with two variables is that it's not just one answer anymore. It's a whole set. It's almost like you're dating someone. If you change, they change. If they change, you change, right? We call it a dependent and independent variable, okay? So as x changes, let's go ahead and come up with a number line here, x's and y's. I'm gonna put zero right in the middle here. If x is zero, the absolute value of zero is zero. How far is zero away from zero? Is zero spaces away. If x is one, the absolute value of one is one. Absolute values in, in all practice make everything positive. If x is two, absolute value of two is two. Easy peasy. If we go on the other side, negative one, absolute value of negative one, uh-oh. Well, that's not hard, because absolute values just make everything positive. 
positive one. How about app's value of negative two? That's going to be two. So now we're gonna graph this, and this graph is gonna look a little bit funny to us. Okay, let's go ahead and plot the points zero, zero, one, one, two, two. That looks like a straight line. On the other side, negative one, positive one, negative two, positive two, we end up with this graph that looks like a V. And these absolute value linear lines will look like a V. And let's talk about why in just a little bit, okay? In a little bit, we'll just talk about why. So, If I want to look at this graph a little differently, what if I said all the x values are positive? If all the x values are positive, do I even have to write this graph with an absolute value sign? If x was positive, can't this graph here just be rewritten without an absolute value? Example, if I said, if I promised you that x was always going to be positive. If x was 1, if x was 2, if x was 3, does the absolute value even matter? It doesn't. So we could say x equals to 1 when, um, when x is greater than 0, even equal to. This is my condition. We can graph the graph as x equals to 1 as long as it's positive, we can write it without the absolute value sign. But what happens if x is negative? x is negative. Well, what does the absolute value sign do to my problem? Does it make it positive? So when x is negative, is less than zero, here is my new representation. Negative x. So I want to show you something interesting on the graph. I'm going to do a shading method. So when x is positive, isn't that this part of the graph? So this blue part of the graph is when x is greater than zero. So we are going to use the graph x equals, sir, y is equal to x. If you remember graphing lines, if I asked you to graph y is equal to x, what is the slope of x? Is it positive one or negative one? It's positive one, right? Y equals to mx plus b. So y is equal to one x plus zero. So we have a zero here and a slope one over one, one over one, one over one. If x is negative, let me illustrate that with a highlight of red here. If x is negative, isn't x negative all on the left side? So if it's negative, we are going to use our negative x version. So the reason why these look like V graphs is because this is really just the graph of a regular line. It's just a regular Y is equal to X graph. But because of the absolute value, my negative version here needs a negative sign in front of it. Alex, give me one second. Let me show you guys what, what I mean here. If I plug in negative one to this problem, doesn't the negative and the negative cancel out to make it look like a positive. Let me write this a little nicer. If I said x was negative one, when I plug in the negative one, doesn't the negative I put here 
right? Remember that negative wasn't there before. Doesn't that make it look like the positive version? If I plug in x is negative 2, and I plug it in, doesn't that y become a negative negative, become a positive 2 now? Looks like my positive version. If I wrote x is negative 3, I plug it in. Does that become a positive version? What happens is I am faking the absolute value without having to write it. I'm faking it by sticking a negative sign there. And when you do that for regular lines, it looks like a change in slope. So that's the concept of it. And this is actually the calculus way of understanding it, like algebra two calculus way of understanding how to graph this is that when I have an absolute value sign, remember how we broke it up into two different versions? Right, we broke up into two different versions. That's actually what we're gonna do here. So let me give you another problem real quick. And we'll first look at it really quickly, and then we will um, look at the fast way of doing it. Okay, let's give you guys another problem y is equal to absolute value of x plus 2. Okay, so this problem, I added some more stuff into the absolute value. Now, you can look at it a couple of different ways, but let me ask you, this is the main question you have to see. What value of x would make this all go to zero? What value of x will make the problem go to zero. If x was one, would that make the absolute value go to zero? If x was two, three, four, five, six, what number could x be to make this go to zero? If you're not sure, we do the algebra one problem. Hey, when would x plus two become zero? x would have to be negative two to become zero. Thank you, Aaliyah. Good job. So here is what you have to think. If x was negative 2, what's the absolute value of negative 2 plus 2? Isn't that just 0? Do we even need an absolute value sign for that? So on a number line, let me just draw this on the side. Something that we should be thinking about. At negative 2, that's when the problem goes to 0. But if I pick a number that's bigger than negative 2, okay, negative 1, 0, and 1, do I need the absolute value sign for those? Do I need the absolute value sign for those? For if I plug in negative 1, x is 0, or x is 1. Oops. 0. Do I really need an absolute value sign for these? Or are the answers all going to be positive? They're all going to be positive anyways, aren't they? So the idea here is we have to think of a number that breaks the absolute value sign. So one version here is y is equal to x plus 2. No absolute value sign at all. Don't need it. Throw it in the trash. When x is greater than negative 2. I'm going to say greater than or equal to. Because if x was greater than negative 2, what happens is I don't need an absolute value sign. Let's look at my next version y is greater than, sorry, y is equal to negative x plus 2. When x is less than negative 2. Now, why did I write it this way? Remember, absolute values break a problem into two different versions, a positive and negative version. And that's what we're doing here, break into a positive and negative version. So for this one, that's right. Let's try x. If x was um, on my number line, negative 3. x was negative 4. x was negative 5. 
y is equal to negative, negative 3 plus 2 is negative, negative 1. So what, what did this negative do to this negative? It forced it to become a positive. y is equal to negative, negative 4 plus 2, negative, negative 2. What did this negative do to this negative? It forced it to become a positive. y is equal to negative, negative 5 plus 2, negative, negative 3, positive. Now, I want to show you something kind of interesting. Look at the answers on the right side of the graph. Oops. And look at the answers on the left side of the graph. Do they look the same? Let's graph these points. When this is when x equals to negative 1, x is equal to 0, x is equal to 1, okay? So when x is equal to negative 1, the y value is 1. When x is equal to 0, right, this is 0, y is equal to 2. When x is equal to 1, y is On the left side, when x is equal to negative 3, y is 1. When x is negative 4, y is 2. When x is negative 5, y is 3. And what happens when we said when x is equal to exactly negative 2? What do we say here? It's going to be zero. Now look at the graph I just drew. It's our absolute value type graph. So these absolute value value equations follow this model and the model is y so absolute value Follow this model. Y is equal to M X minus H plus K. That's the model, and that's the model we talked about on one of the first days of class. Where M is a slope, H and K is my vertex. Meaning that's this special corner point in my graph. So let's look at what we wrote already so far in my last example. And let me copy it. Y is equal to absolute value of x plus 2. What is the m for the graph? What is the h for the graph? And what is the k for this graph? Okay, looking at the model, the h is inside my absolute value. My k is on the outside of the absolute value, and the m is always in front of that absolute value. Okay, what is the m? What's in front of the absolute value? Do you guys see a number? We can't write zero. It's an invisible what? Invisible one. Where is the h and k here? The h, there's a negative sign already here. This is a common practice in Algebra 1, Algebra 2, and pre-calculus. So since there's a negative, this is going to be rewritten as a negative 2. If h was negative 2, that would become a positive 2. Do we have a k value outside at all? Zero. Now, look at the graph we just drew here in our previous example. What is the vertex of the graph? Negative 2, the y value is sitting on the floor. Negative 2, 0, just like what we claimed it to be. 
what is the slope of the graph? Rise one over one, rise one over one, rise one over one. Ooh, that totally worked. On the left side, it's always the negative version. Why does it say M is one? M is, remember, in front of my absolute value sign right there? That's my slope of the graph because these are line graphs. So M is one. So the slope is rise, up one, run one, up one, run one, up one, run one. And all that changes is for the negative side is up one, back one, up one, back one, up one, back one. So the slope becomes M equals to negative one on the left side. Let's do another example to help you guys out with this. If you guys graph parabolas in Algebra 1 and you had it in um, point slope form, I think, or standard form, I forgot what it's called, vertex, oh, vertex form, vertex form, that's it, vertex form. So if I say y is equal to 1 half x minus one plus one, okay? Seems like a lot, okay? So our fast way of graphing this is we could go through the process of doing all this stuff up here, we could. But instead, let's use this formula. What is the slope of this line? What is the h and k of this line? What is the vertex? So what is the slope of my absolute value equation? In front of the absolute value. Thank you. What is my h and k? Be careful. I want you guys to write that down right now in your notes. Can you tell me what your h and k is? And now write it in the chat. Thank you very much. H is one, K is one. Remember it's eight X minus H. So H is just one. And K is the value on the outside. One to one, one comma one, it's a point. So here's how fast we can graph these absolute value problems now. We know that if I plugged in one here, doesn't that go to zero? And that's the center of my absolute value sign. Because that's when everything breaks, is it positive or negative? One, one. And here's how fast we can draw the line. If this is a positive slope, we rise up one over two. Rise over run. Rise up one, run two. That's on the right side. On the left, our negative slope is negative one over two. So we're going to use up one and back two to make it easy on us. Up one, back two. Up one, back two. And that's our V graph. That's our absolute value graph. So if we can tell the characteristics of these absolute value graphs, they're actually very easy to graph. Now, why did I go through the process of talking about all these different things up back here? Because this is the bigger understanding. If you can find where the zero is, you can tell when the graph is going up and the opposite version, going down, the positive and negative version, just like what we did before. Okay. Let's do one more example. Y is equal to negative two X plus um, one minus one. Please tell me my M value and then tell me my H and K value. Okay, my slope is going to be negative two. My H and K, please be careful, it's going to be negative one, negative one. You can rewrite it as X minus negative one. That's how you end up with a positive. Two negatives make a positive, right? Two wrongs make a right. And negative one, negative one, 
put a dot. And that's, I guarantee you, that's the center of my vertex. Now, here's the tricky part. The slope is negative two. So negative two over one, negative one, two over one. We're heading in, we're losing money here. And my flip slope is gonna be a positive. So negative two over one, make it negative. This becomes a positive two. Oops. So on the other side, and the problem is I can't do two, wait, I can't do two and two this way. So to make this fit, please be careful guys, everyone. This is gonna be negative two over negative one. Negative two over negative one. Again, negative two over negative one. It turns out this is a B graph facing down. And one way you can automatically tell that it's facing down is because the slope is negative. Okay, sure. Let me graph that one more time, same, same idea. My vertex is gonna be negative one, negative one. And we said our original slope is negative, right? So on the right side, we'll go down one, two, over one. That's that right slide. And the left side is always just a copy. It's a mirror reflection. So if you want, you can just draw that if you want. Yes. So from here, I go down one, two spaces, right? Rise is negative two, run is negative one. Negative two, negative one. So rise is negative two, run is negative one. How did I get this point here is remember, if this is a plus and plus, that's a positive two. But we can also make them both negative because a negative two over negative one is still positive two. You can do the same negative trick like what we did up here, where we said negative one half is really just pick a side with a negative. The bottom could be negative or the top could be negative. And this will still be negative one half.